Okay, today we're here with Eliar Sidagati. Um, I know I got that wrong. Um, um, uh, how, how are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing fine. Uh, just uh, yeah, recovering from the last shift uh, from Paranal, but yeah, everything fine. <laughs> so um, I understand you're, that you've been observing the atmosphere fear of a hot Jupiter exoplanet called Wasps 19b. Um, can you tell me what's unique about this planet that makes it such an interesting target for study? Uh, yes. So this is uh, so this is a um, how Jupiter, basically what that means is that they have, the planet is roughly the size of the Jupiter, but it's very, very close to its host star. Uh, so close that if it was any closer, actually, it would be torn apart by the gravity from, the, from, uh, from its host. Uh, and because it's so close and it, it receives so much radiation, it's, its equilibrium temperature is very high. And that basically means that it has a very extended atmosphere, atmosphere that goes up uh, far from uh, from the uh, from the planet, and this basically allows us to actually probe uh, the atmosphere. Allows us to see what uh, what the species are in the atmosphere because of this extended what we call the scale height. So that's what makes it quite interesting. Awesome. So, uh, what makes the presence of titanium oxide in the atmosphere so unusual for a planet? Uh, it doesn't actually make it unusual. It's the fact that it's been so hard to find. I mean, uh, in, in a paper in 2008 by, um, uh, by, uh, by a couple of professors in Santa Barbara, uh, they actually predicted the presence of metal oxides, which t uh, titanium oxide is one, uh, in, in, in the atmosphere of these uh, highly irradiated planets because you expect that because of the high temperatures, these heavier uh, elements would actually, well, heavier molecules will be mixed uh, to the higher parts of the atmosphere. And uh, so their presence would actually uh, shape the, in, the intake and, out, and, and the output of energy that, that, the, um, that the planet receives. Uh, and actually is able, uh, so, so basically helps us uh, put some constraints on the uh, priors that we have, uh, prior knowledge that we need in order to create atmospheric models for atmospheres. Uh, so it's not that it's like, so titanium oxide itself is actually quite rare on Earth. It's not something that we see. We actually see titanium dioxide, which is basically the ingredient we use, for example, in sunscreen. It's something that absorbs uh, UV radiation uh, and visible radiation. Um, but titanium oxide is actually something that we see in stars quite a lot. And uh, so their presence is not actually a surprise. It was just very difficult to get them because you need very, very good, good observations and very precise uh, what we call transit light curves in order to be able to detect uh, these heavier, um, heavier elements because their signature in the transmission spectrum is not quite as strong as uh, atoms. Awesome. So, uh, what made the um, European Southern Observatory's uh, very large telescope especially useful for this study? Okay, so uh, I mean there is a there is a combination of factors. So as as you know, the uh, the VLT is not is not the biggest telescope in the world, in, well, individual ones, but uh, as a, as an observatory and in, and in terms of the, the instruments that we use at that telescope, it is the most advanced observatory in the world. And what, so what we basically need to do for these observations is that we need to perform a spectroscopy at very high time resolution. What that means is that we need to take spectra very, very quickly. So we, we basically typically took a spectra around, um, well, we took around 400 spectra in a space of uh, two, three hours. So which means that in order to be able to get a lot of signal in a short time, you need very large telescopes to collect a lot of light. So that so VLT solves that problem by having 8.2 meter telescopes, and also we need dedicated instruments that are able to perform this sort of study. And the instrument that we've been using here is called Force Two, which is, which is on the Unit Telescope One of the VLT. And what makes it usable for this science case is that you're able to actually obtain simultaneous spectra for the target that actually has a planet around it, as well as lots of other stars in the field of view of the telescope. And you need that in order to correct for atmospheric uh, 
imprint on the light curve because if, if you don't have that uh, correction, it will be almost impossible to perform the study because of course, as, as we observe the star, the star goes through an arc in the sky and uh, atmospheric turbulence and of course atmospheric um, so basically where the star is and the path it takes along, uh, along the line of sight uh, you know, creates a very unusual pattern on the, on the light curve. So we need this, uh, what we call reference stars, in order to correct uh, for these changes, uh, in order to get the light curves that, you, that you have, you've probably seen in the, in, in the paper. So that's what makes, I mean, there are, there are only a handful of uh, telescope slash instruments that are able to do this kind of study. And FORCE 2, in combination with, with the VLT, has been the most successful by far to perform such studies on, on the ground. So, uh, can you um, tell me about this new technique for um, analyzing an exoplanet's atmosphere that you developed? And uh, do you think it will be used for observations of other planets? Okay, so I must say that the, so the method that we've been using, it wasn't developed by me. It was actually, a, it, it's a method, so basically for, uh, it's, it's machine learning and it's using what is called the Gaussian process in order to include uh, any systematic trends that we have in our transit light curves. They, uh, so, this, so this method has, uh, has, has been used in, in, in other, other fields of science uh, since, since a long time and actually it was one of my collaborators a few years ago in 2012 that wrote a paper that basically showed its application to analyzing time series data. Uh, so we basically built on, on that technique um, and this is something that, so basically, uh, I mean, there are, there are a few different schools of thought uh, to, as to how to deal with systematic trends in, in the light curves. And we believe that ours is a more comprehensive as opposed to others because it's a non-parametric non approach, uh, that it is quite conservative in quoting the, uh, the, the precision in our measurements because it, it is really the, um, the precision that determines the significance of your detections, any detections that you have. So it's really important that you explain to the reader that basically the way that you derive the precision in the data points is, is conservative and is realistic. And, and we believe that we, mo um, so the method that we use, it basically actually uses physical inputs, so things that could possibly cause the systematic trends in the light curves, be it from the telescope or from the atmosphere, we use those as an input in order to model our systematic trends as opposed to other methods that basically just apply uh, some blind function. Um, so that's why we hope that, um, I mean, the community has, has started to, uh, to apply this sort of techniques uh, to uh, doing this, certain, uh, this sort of analysis, so hopefully we will continue and people will start, of course, developing more and more sophisticated ways of defining what we call the covariance matrix that describes the uh, correlated noise in the data. Well, uh, that's all the um, questions I have. Um, anything you'd like to add? Um, okay, so, um, I mean, we are really at the, at, the, at the beginning of detecting and analyzing at, um, exoplanet atmospheres, so, uh, I mean, what's the future is very bright for this field, especially with the um, uh, with the upcoming James Webb uh, Space Telescope from NASA, because uh, that is, so at the moment uh, we can do this sort of study from space with the Hubble Space Telescope, and I mean, ideally we want to do this stuff from uh, this this kind of studies from the uh, from the space as opposed to the ground, because actually if you're doing this from the space, you actually don't need those that reference stars that I was talking about, and the light curve is a lot cleaner, and the uh, systematic trends are a lot less. The problem with the Hubble is that Hubble is on a uh, low Earth orbit, so it's a spinning uh, around the Earth at at a uh, period of a few hours. And the problem is when we are trying to observe a uh, transit of an exoplanet that's four or five hours, we always have gaps uh, in the uh, in the uh, coverage of the transit, and of course uh, also have systematics because of the phase that uh, the phase at which that Hubble is observing. But of course, with James Webb Space Telescope, that's not going to be the case. James Webb is actually going far, far away from the Earth, and it won't be spinning around the Earth 
and uh, so it, it, it will be placed at a uh, kind of equilibrium uh, point between the Earth and the Sun and the Moon system is called Lagrange point two. So James Webb Space Telescope, first of all, will be able to completely cover entire uh, transits. It, it will have a, it's, it's a six meter mirror in space as opposed to Hubble's one meter. So it will have a much larger collecting area. And of course, it's also in, it works in the infrared where all the interesting stuff happens. So all the, um, so any, any possible sign of life that could be on any planet, generally, as far as we can guess, it should, uh, we should be able to detect it in infrared. I'm not saying that they will be able to detect it. I think we are still a couple of generations away in terms of instrumentation to get to that sort of uh, observations. But we are, I mean, we are getting there. We are, we are getting towards uh, observations where we can actually detect and, and, and analyze atmosphere of rocky planets that are in the habitable zone of their host star. So planets that could possibly harbor life. Uh, if, if, they do, if they are harboring them, we should be able to uh, detect their signs in their atmospheres. So uh, hopefully they, uh, the science that we are doing, its primary goal being understanding planetary evolution and planetary uh, formation, but eventually it will also provide us with a path to actually detect possible biosignatures in exoplanet atmosphere. So that's why I think this, this science case is quite exciting and it's worth investing uh, more, more time and effort into it. Well, uh, thanks for joining us. No problem at all. It's my pleasure.